हरे कृष्णा ओम ज्ञान तिरांध्य ज्ञानाजन शलाकया चक्षुन्मीत तस्म श्रीगुरव नम नम ओं विष्णुपाता कृष्ण प्रेष्टा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदास्वामी नामिने नमस्ते सारस्वते देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेषून्यवादी पाश्चातारिणे जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभुनिनंद श्रीअद्वैतगदाधर श्रीवासादिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे most of us in india at least in my generation heard about hare krishna and the krishna consciousness movement in the context of hippies and it was not in a very positive sense and uh, later on when i took to krishna consciousness and then became serious as a devotee then i started wondering and i started to get to know a little bit more about what is who are these hippies and how did the hippie movement come about today in the social history of america or in the world for that matter mid 1960s is considered to be the time of what is known as the counter culture movement the counter culture movement is described as the an anti establishment cultural phenomena that developed throughout much of western world during mid 60s and mid 70s actually what was happening in the west young people from colleges and high schools and some of them who had completed their education coming from affluent western families they became disillusioned about normal life what was known as in america what was celebrated as the american dream the american dream was about having a family having good education having a good job having a lot of money and trying to be happy in this way but somehow the younger generation in the 60s had seen that their parents and their families were not really as happy as the great american dream promised them to be so they were looking for an alternative to the way of life typified by the american dream and as a reaction to this kind of a uh, american dream mainstream establishment and all of that they embraced a philosophy that rejected capitalism and in the 60s that was the time where there was us military intervention in vietnam and the young people were opposing that they were actually unhappy with christianity because there were so many scandals and all of that and they were against any authority and conformity of all kinds in fact some of the young people those days it is said who were part of the counter culture 
they had burnt their all kinds of ID cards that they had just to establish their anonymity. And they were searching for new meaning to life and reality. But being misled, unfortunately, the tools of the search were drugs, sex, music, and alternative spirituality. The architects of the newly minted hippie movement preached and believed that music and drugs, particularly LSD, which was just then invented or discovered, opened new avenues of perception by which people can expand their consciousness. And in fact, there was one American Harvard University professor, Professor Timothy Leary. He was experimenting with these drug-induced expansion of consciousness as part of his research and he was promoting. And at that time, LSD was not yet banned. They just thought that it was some kind of a drug which led to some kind of a uh, f some kind of a new experience and uh, uh, the addictive nature of it was not yet understood and so it was a permitted drug and so it all began in this way and of course later on Professor Timothy Leary was fired from Harvard University. Another important person at that time was Allen Ginsberg. He was a poet and uh, he used to write poems on the theme of, that was very familiar, that was the, the spirit of the people of the counterculture. And so there were hundreds and thousands of Americans who would drop out of their college or school or drop out of their jobs and come to two important places in America. One was New York, Lower Manhattan. Another place was in a district called Haight-Ashbury District in San Francisco. These two were considered to be the epicenters of counterculture. And uh, so it was the will of the Lord that your devotee Srila Prabhupada representing the tradition of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wanting to spread love of God wanting to spread the Nama Sankirtana Hari Nama Sankirtana came to these two places first in Lower Manhattan in when he opened the temple on 26 Second Avenue and next he moved to San Francisco and some of his early followers had moved to San Francisco and they were facilitating opening the second ISKCON temple in San Francisco and that also happened very close to Haight-Ashbury district. So it was the will of the Lord because these were young people and they were looking for something different from mainstream American life and they had an inclination and, and, in, and curiosity about spirituality and they were interested in the metaphysical philosophies coming from the East and they were dabbling with Buddhism and concepts of Buddhism and they seem to be the most likely recipients of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mercy. 
They were willing to give time. They were willing to hear the philosophy that Srila Prabhupada wanted to present to them. And so uh, quite a few of them took to Krishna consciousness. And Srila Prabhupada was aware of this. In one letter in 1969, Srila Prabhupada writes, Actually, the hippies are our best customers. Almost all of our important disciples are recruited from that group, and you are also from that group. He was writing to Gaur Sundar. So actually, we should try to serve the hippie group more than others, because there is a great potency of recruiting Krishna consciousness devotees from them. You will be pleased to know that one hippie girl named Chris, who came to see me in your apartment, is now living in our Los Angeles temple and doing very nicely. So if you make propaganda among the hippie group simply by our standard method, Sankirtana, reading some portion of Bhagavad Gita and distributing prasadam, then I am sure the quarters in which you have now shifted will be very much prospective. Prabhupada was writing this to Gaur Sundar, who was exploring setting up Krishna consciousness in another place in America. In fact, even in 1971, Srila Prabhupada wrote a letter to Satswarupa, and he said, but for the time being, why not open a hostel for the hippies? I want that all the hippies should come to me and I shall solve their problems. Actually, all these hippies should join us. I'm seeing that in this Delhi city. Now Prabhupada was referring to something happening in Delhi, 1971. He had come to India and he was seeing in Delhi. I'm seeing that in this Delhi city, many hippies from your country are coming, but they are simply hungry and dirty and being cheated. During our Pandal program, some of them came to me and became my disciples. So we must look out for them <clears throat> and take interest that they should be delivered from this miserable condition. Please see, even in this situation, Srila Prabhupada is seeing how we can deliver them from that miserable situation they are in. They are our best customers. If we give them place to sleep comfortably and nice prasadam, and if they agree to follow the four rules, Prabhupada never compromised. He wanted them to follow the four regulatory principles. And follow the four rules and attend our aratis and classes why not invite the hippies to live with us? Gradually they will become devotees. The American ambassador to India, Mr. Kenneth Keating, is very much in favor of our movement, especially on this point of giving you people the right advice and saving them from the intoxication and saving them from intoxication and being hippies. If your government would give us some help, I can save all of them. That would be a great blessing for your country. Otherwise, this hippie class will simply spoil everything they have worked so hard for. So, we can see during Srila Prabhupada's early days, he was conscious of uh, uh, this hippies and how they were taking to Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada called them the best customers and all of that. Nevertheless, there was also awareness of Shila, in, in Srila Prabhupada about the downsides of being associated with the hippies. In another letter, early in 1969, Prabhupada writes, Professor Dr. Franz Bernhard, a learned scholar in Indology, was present a few days ago. Professor Dr. Franz Bernard had met Srila Prabhupada and they had a conversation. We had a long discussion yesterday evening when he came to see me and he admitted that all his philosophical talks were simply wasting time. 
He was a professor of philosophy. He remarked another thing that he had thought of us as hippies because he saw that Ginsberg on the notice board seemingly like one of our members. From his conversation, I understood that people are very badly impressed about Allen Ginsberg, especially respectable persons on account of his hippie tendency. So Professor uh, Allen Ginsberg, a poet, was very popular among the counterculture people, but among the respectable mainstream people, he was not so respectable. So this was the contrast. On the one hand, there were young hippies, young people who were coming from the counterculture background. They were taking to Krishna consciousness quite easily, but then the mainstream American society, professors and academia, they would have some kind of a concern about Krishna consciousness movement. So this was a situation that Srila Prabhupada was actually facing. I, of course, supported our case that Ginsburg is a great friend of our society and we, we advise everyone to chant Hare Krishna and I believe he also does so. Anyway, we should be very much careful not to publish anything in our Back to Godhead paper, which will give impression to the public that we are inclined to the hippie movement. In our papers, nothing should be published which has even a small tinge of hippie ideas. You see how Prabhupada was instructing, being very careful. And then he saw that most of his initial followers who were involved in printing this book, ma magazine, all of that, they all came from that background. And then he, so he was warning them. I must tell you in this connection that if you have any sympathies with the hippie movement, you should kindly give it up. He was writing to one of the devotees who was involved in the Back to God magazine and writing articles for these things. <clears throat> so this was the reality. And uh, so when I, here in India in the 80s, when I was taking to Krishna consciousness, and uh, I got to hear about, this was actually the situation. They were actually coming from well-to-do families, but they were sincerely looking for an alternate meaning and an alternate lifestyle, an alternate purpose to life. And so they were the right recipients and Srila Prabhupada had a wonderful philosophy. Srila Prabhupada blended music and meditation and chanting and all of that. And he had strict rules. And so gradually, not all of them, of course, some of them who were sincere and wanted to take to Krishna consciousness, who were fortunate, took to Krishna consciousness, and they helped Srila Prabhupada build this movement. So Srila Prabhupada has now come to San Francisco. His, uh, some of his disciples who were initiated in New York, they have come here, Mukunda and Janaki, and they have also roped in some of their friends and their contacts who are also interested in spirituality. And uh, there was a wonderful reception for Srila Prabhupada. We must remember those days, Prabhupada was, and Iskon was very small. And so we don't have too many pictures from that time. I've just gathered two pictures of Srila Prabhupada's reception and I would like to share with all of you. <clears throat> this is a black and white picture of uh, Srila Prabhupada uh, being received uh, at the San Francisco airport. You can see uh, the elderly man with a bald head and beard in the front, who is also singing, that's Allen Ginsberg. And he received Srila Prabhupada with a bouquet of flowers, and that's what Prabhupada is holding. And right behind Srila Prabhupada is Mukunda with the beard. You can see that there's a black beard. 
And to the right of Srila Prabhupada, there were two other young men who later on became Shamsundar and Gurudas. And uh, we all know that when Srila Prabhupada arrived in uh, San Francisco airport, these young American followers, they were all chanting Hare Krishna, about 50 of them, and received Srila Prabhupada. There's yet another picture. This is a color pic colorful picture that I would like to share of the same uh, occasion when Srila Prabhupada arrived. And this is a, a colorful picture in U United Airlines uh, terminal of the airport. And we can see here uh, Melanie and Janaki also uh, with Srila Prabhupada and other devotees, all of them chanting and singing and receiving Srila Prabhupada. <clears throat> Now these young followers, they came together and they planned that before Srila Prabhupada arrived in San Francisco. So they were thinking that uh, what should we do because Srila Prabhupada had told Mukunda to help open a center in the west coast and they were all here. So at that time they were discussing they had three objectives in mind. One was, we have to introduce Swami to San Francisco, especially the young people of the counterculture movement. And second, they wanted to help him spread the chant and spread his message. Very interesting, even though they were involved in you know, in the Western culture and materialism, and they came from such background, they had identified in a few months of exposure to Krishna consciousness that these were important things that Prabhupada was looking for. So their objective was, number one, to introduce Swami to San Francisco, number two, to help him spread the chant and his message, and number three, to raise money to set up the temple that Prabhupada wanted to set up. So with these three ideas, they were thinking what to do. And they all came up with this idea that they should have a musical concert, a paid musical concert, and then invite some of the well-known bands uh, of that time. And when those bands are there, and when people hear about those names, and have a good venue for these kind, where these kind of uh, gatherings and music concerts would happen, and that would not, and distribute flyers and 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 pamphlets and posters and put up posters in that area where all of these kind of young people would gather, and all and that would bring a lot of people. So that was their idea. And uh, so they, I, they were looking for an appropriate venue and obviously they didn't have money. So they, went to, they were, looked for a venue who, the, who would, where they could get it free of cost. And the venue they got was uh, what was known as Avalon Ball, Ballroom. I have a few pictures to share with you. This is a uh, 1960s picture. You can see if you see closely there, it's written there, there is a signage on the top of the uh, uh, upper half of the picture. You can see Avalon written there. There's another picture. I think this is more a recent picture. It's a color picture. And also, uh, I'm, I've not personally seen these places, uh, Avalon Ballroom. It's somewhere around. It is in the, it's in the, uh, near this street corner. And... Uh, Another picture of the interiors of the ballroom. Uh, this is how the ballroom was. It was a big hall. There were no seats and it was meant for a gathering. Uh, all, so this kind of gatherings would happen where they would have music and, and all of these kind of things. And uh, so uh, this was the venue that became available to the devotees. 
and the devotees wanted to have the music concert here. And so with the contacts they had, they would go around and talking and they list, enlisted quite a few well-known names of that time, especially among the, the counterculture genre. And uh, so they got them either practically for a free of cost or for a very small amount. Another thing that uh, they had to do was uh, design a, a poster. So, and the, there was some style that was very common among these young people. And so they were looking for an, uh, an artist uh, who would do this poster, design this poster for them. And in fact, there was somebody who had had contact with Swami in New York, had now moved to San Francisco, and he was an artist and he was available. So Mukunda contacted him and got him to make that design a poster. And then another important consideration for them was if there is some kind of a celebrity who introduces Swami to San Francisco, that will help. And so they were looking for a celebrity and they somehow got in touch with uh, someone who knew Allen Ginsberg and Allen Ginsberg agreed to be part of this music concert and they were uh, to introduce Swami. All of these interesting things fell one after the other. They got a venue free of cost, they uh, got a few well-known bands of the time enlisted to uh, come and perform and uh, in fact they got the venue, the venues were most the, the most sought after dates were Saturday evenings and Sunday, Friday evenings and Saturday evenings. And they could not get the venue at that time and probably they could not afford also. So they chose Sunday evening. The man who was involved in the, the owner of this Avalon uh, ballroom, he was warning them, be careful Sunday. I've never heard of any concerts happening, people gathering, but then they took a risk and they because it was coming free and that's that their financial situation was like that. And then they found this artist who was also connected to Swami who agreed to come and do this uh, poster. And then they also got in touch with Allen Ginsberg who agreed to come and introduce Swami. So one after another, all things were falling in place and uh, uh, they decided to have this one and I have a poster during at that time what was made at that time to share with all of you and uh, you can see there is the poster and uh, on the left side it's the poster says Krishna consciousness comes west and above that they had a picture of Swami that is uh, you know I've blown up the poster on the right side you can see uh, Srila Prabhupada in a very very humorous moment with his hand up touching his head and uh, uh, I have another image to read the text a little more carefully. The next image, I've just made a little closer version of that poster. You can see there it says, Krishna consciousness comes west. Swami Bhakti Vedanta Allen Ginsberg. Please note, at that time, Swami Bhakti, he was not known as Srila Prabhupada. And he was known as Swami. They used to call him Swami and he had, he, they knew his name was Bhaktivedanta Swami. So they put the name Swami Bhaktivedanta Allen Ginsberg. And followed by they wrote the names of the bands who were very popular at that time and they were all going to perform. The Grateful Dead, Moby Grape, Big Brother, The Holding Company. And they had coined this name they had a few discussions, what, is, what should we call this music concert? And they came up with this name, Mantra Rock Dance. So it was appropriate because Swami had wanted to popularize mantra and these young people were, knowing, were looking for rock and dance. And so all of this came together as a Mantra Rock Dance. And you can see it was happening on Sunday, January 29th, 1967. And the venue was Avalon Ballroom. And they expected people, all of them, to come at about 8 p.m. So this was the thing. And then I have another picture, which is a further close-up for just for all of you to read. And uh, so there was, they also had planned some 
uh, psychedelic lighting and slides to be thrown on at the back of the stage on the walls of the uh, Avalon ballroom. And so that is what is listed there. Uh, Sutter and, and Van Ness and so on. Uh, and then uh, so and then it says bring cushions, drums, bells, cymbals. So they were inviting people to bring, you know, all these kind of musical instruments. And then, of course, they all brought them. And then it says proceeds to opening of San Francisco Krishna Temple. You see, they straight mentioned that they were, they were, this is going to support opening of the San Francisco Krishna Temple. Uh, lights by so on, so and so on. Ah, and another thing, if you closely notice, it says two dollars fifty cents, two point five dollars. That's the, that's what people had to pay to come for this. So all of this is mentioned in the in the <clears throat> post. And I want you to closely notice further below, there is a picture of a line drawing of Radha and Krishna in a circle. So we can see that how these young American followers, hardly a few months of exposure to Krishna consciousness, had put together an event of this kind to help Srila Prabhupada bring Krishna consciousness to the West and spread, spread the Hare Krishna mantra and spread his message. It's so amazing that they had this kind of an idea and they came up with this. So now, uh, <clears throat> uh, so the, they had distributed the pamphlets and stuck the posters in different places as much as they could to create awareness. But they were in a lot of anxiety. Will people show up? Will people come? We have brought Swami from New York and he has come to San Francisco. And on that particular day, if people don't show up, what will happen? So they were in a lot of anxiety. And on that day in the morning, uh, these young few, Mukunda, Janaki, and the initiation had happened. So Shamsundar and uh, Malati and a few others, they all gathered and they all had the different services. They went, to, they distributed to, went around making all the arrangements. And then it was uh, uh, planned that Srila Prabhupada would come at 10 o'clock in the night. And uh, before that, 8 o'clock onwards, there would be other uh, bands performing. And so already the people have gathered. And then at 10 o'clock, Srila Prabhupada comes there. And then he will perform for about an hour. And after that, there will be more bands just to ensure that there are as many people as possible. And uh, they were themselves. Somebody was selling the ticket, one of these devotees, they were selling tickets and then they would go inside and re relieve each other. And then they were all sharing the different duties connected with organizing an event like this. By 7.45 p.m., Mukunda, who was the main person who was organizing all these things, he gets the news. That the hall is full and there are no more vacancies. The fire department is waiting there to ensure that only the right number of people are allowed inside and they said no more. And there were people lining up and the fire department said if anyone comes out you can send one more person in. So that was the arrangement. So it was a sold out event. <clears throat> and uh, at uh, Eight o'clock, there was a band, uh, one of those bands, and they performed. And, and all the people were happy with that. And that's regular Western band. And then at uh, nine o'clock, the devotees came. Uh, actually, it didn't begin at eight o'clock. It actually began at, began at nine o'clock. From 8 to 9, they were just gathering and they were talking to each other and all of those kind of things. And uh, most of them, those days, those young people, good number of them were high on the trucks. So, you know, that was the situation. But they were interested to know what is this 
Swami coming, Allen Ginsberg coming, there is a mantra, rock and dance and all of these kind of things. So at nine o'clock, about 15 devotees who were there, they all got onto the stage and they had a tambura and they started playing that and started with a short skirtan, the way Swami had taught them. And for a short while, and after that, one of the rock bands joined and the devotees stepped out and, and there was this big band of Moby Grape and the crowd went wild. The ballroom shook with their amplified music. The crowd gyrated. The music was deafening and the light show was going on and it was mesmerizing. This went on for a good length of time. And then, a little up before 10 o'clock, the band stopped and people were expecting, now Swami will come. And at the stroke of 10, the rear side door opened and, and the spotlight was now on the door and the door opened and Swami walked in. Swami was accompanied by two devotees, Ranchor and Kirtanananda. And as Swami stepped in, the crowd was silent and they parted and made way. And Swami walked in. And Swami Srila Prabhupada was wearing a garland, garland of gardenia flowers and he was wearing a silk shirt. Prabhupada didn't have too many silk shirts, the same one which he had come in in the flight a few days ago and he was wearing the same silk shirt and uh, he walked in. <clears throat> there was a spontaneous roar of approval as he reached the stage. And there he was met by Allen Ginsberg and Prabhupada said Namaste to him and Allen Ginsberg also with folded hands received Swami and they talked a little bit and then Allen pointed out they had kept two cushions, one for Swami and one for Allen and both of them sat down and there were devotees brought few more garlands and they offered to Srila Prabhupada and the roar became an ovation. People were very happy to see Allen Ginsberg and Swami on the stage. They were anticipating, uh, in great anticipation, they were waiting what is going to happen. And uh, uh, Yamuna, who was also there at that time, she recalls, I wanted to read a small text from her recollection. To me, it looked like Swami glided rather than walked. Here was this diminutive, refined, older gentleman in saffron among a group of rocked out and drugged out hippies. And yet he completely charmed and captivated everyone. How can the magnitude of his presence be described? It was simply unprecedented. So Srila Prabhupada sat there with Allen Ginsberg. Prabhupada looked regal. He looked like golden Buddha, saintly, calm and transcendental. Allen Ginsberg leaned forward to say something to Swami and Swami also leaned and he nodded. And then Allen Ginsberg began to speak. And there was a microphone in front of him and uh, he had a powerful voice and he started speaking. And he said that how few years ago he had been to India and there he had got introduced to the chanting of this mantra. And whenever I chant this mantra, I get enthralled. Alan Ginsberg said. And I want to introduce to all of you this mantra and I want all of you to sing this mantra 
And you, I want all of you to also feel enthralled like I feel every time I sing this mantra. And then he said that this mantra, this is singing, it's a kind of a meditation that is musical. This was his explanation. And then he described that how this is, a, this is known as the Maha Mantra. Maha means great, Man means mind, Tra means deliverance. And so this is a great mind deliverance. And this was the explanation he gave. And then he also said something that all of them could relate with. And he said, uh, it will transport you to another dimension and it will stabilize your consciousness on your LSD re-entry. Something that they all could relate with. And then he started talking. Now I'm so happy to introduce Swami Bhakti Vedanta. And uh, he lived actually in a very peaceful village in India. And uh, he is so elderly and he could have just lived there. But he wanted to share this mantra and this wonderful message with us. And so he started a temple in New York. And now he has come to San Francisco and he has started a temple on Frederick Street. And now he has actually come with this wonderful message to the seekers of San Francisco. And when he said that, there was a big, loud applause in the crowd. And then Srila Prabhupada began to speak. <clears throat> Prabhupada said, thank you for inviting me to this beautiful city of San Francisco. And then Prabhupada began to tell about the Hare Krishna mantra. And he said, Krishna is not a Hindu God. He's not an Indian God. He's God for everyone. And this chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra helps us to go back to Krishna, to the spiritual world to the transcendental world. He spoke for a short while. And then he looked at Allen Ginsberg and said, now you can lead. And Allen, he had his harmonium also with him and he started singing. And as he started singing, the mantra flashed on the walls so that others could follow. And the other bands, they also jumped in. They all came on the stage with their big drums and, and guitars and flutes and many other instruments. And the audience, they also had brought so many instruments. They had, they, they started, uh, uh, drums started rolling. And as Allen Ginsberg was singing, they all started. And then Allen Ginsberg also said, you can sing. And if you wish, you can dance. And then... Some of them were dancing, some of them were singing, and it was going on. It was swaying and dancing. <clears throat> and gradually the tempo uh, began to build up. And then, to everyone surprised, Srila Prabhupada stood up and he began to dance with arms raised, swing left and right, left and right, the Swami step. Seeing that, encouraged by that, more and more people, the whole hall practically, they were all stood up and they also started dancing with arms lifted up and the tempo was increasing. And then at one point, Alan Ginsberg brought his microphone and kept it in front of Srila Prabhupada and Prabhupada started singing and the kirtan went on and on and the bands were playing, the, there was people playing the electric guitars and uh, gradually it was like a, one, of the, one of the persons he recalls. The ballroom appeared as, as if it was a human field of wheat blowing in the wind. It produced a calm feeling in contrast to the usual Avalon ballroom atmosphere of gyrating energies, the chanting of Hare Krishna continued for over an hour. And finally, everyone was jumping and yelling. 
even crying and shouting. So this is the kind of a kirtan that Srila Prabhupada created. And uh, it went on and on and on. Prabhupada was actually perspiring. There was perspiration on his. And Kirtanananda, who was watching, he was very concerned that Prabhupada, at this age, he is having this kind of this, it's loud music and, and all of that. And these people singing, dancing, and how long it is going on. He was concerned. And then all of a sudden, Srila Prabhupada, brought the kirtan to a close and he continued chanting om vishnu pada paramaham saparivraja ka acharya stotra shat shri shrimad his divine grace bhakti siddhanta saraswati thakur shila prabhupada ki and those few followers devotees who knew what to do they all bowed down and prabhupada chanted a few prem dhvani mantras for a while and he stopped and he got off from the stage and the people were so thrilled with what had happened. This Hare Krishna mantra and the chanting and the Swami and as Srila Prabhupada stepped down, the audience, they parted. The spotlight continued to follow Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada with his head held erect, very regal, very, very aristocratic, walked with two, three devotees behind him, following him. And as, and the people parted, and there was cheers, crying, and, and, and full of applause. And, and as Srila Prabhupada walked to the door, Ranchor went up and held the door open. Swami walked out, Srila Prabhupada stepped out, and the doors closed behind. And the next band was up on the stage and the music and the band and all of those things continued. And as Srila Prabhupada came out of the Avalon ballroom, he looked at Kirtanananda and Rancho and he said, this is no place for a brahmachari. That was the comment Srila Prabhupada made. <clears throat> Again, this was a, you know, an occasion when uh, ISKCON was in a very, very uh, s s small organization and we don't have too many pictures. And unfortunately, we didn't have mobile phones with cameras and all of those kind of things. There are only a few pictures and I want to share with uh, you these pictures. So you can see in this picture the lights in the background on the back of the stage and you can barely recognize Srila Prabhupada in, uh, in his... Uh, silk kurta and next to him is uh, Allen Ginsberg and a few devotees are sitting with him in the, on the stage and you can see so many people in the foreground in the audience. There's one more version of the same picture, slightly better I think in some ways. Uh, you get a little more understanding of this and uh, so you can see Prabhupada and Allen Ginsberg. And uh, there's one more rare picture a close-up of Srila Prabhupada and Allen Ginsberg. You're in the Avalon ballroom where they are singing. And I think this was at the time when Prabhupada was still sitting and singing. And later on, the standing and the dancing and all of that. The next day, the Frederick Street Temple was filled with young, new people. Actually, this Avalon ballroom was an important milestone in the history of Krishna consciousness going to the West. And this event created a lot of awareness among the young people and more, pe more of those young people started coming to meet Srila Prabhupada in the, and participate in the kirtans in the temple. The next morning, Prabhupada was in his apartment, Mukunda, and Prabhupada sent word for Mukunda and Shamsundar. So, uh, Shamsundar, this was one of the first occasions where he was going to meet Swamiji very closely. And so, Mukunda told him he has to take off his shoes and come up the stairs and then bow down and meet. And, and so, 
After all that, this Mukunda and Shamsundar came into Prabhupada's room and Prabhupada was so happy to see both of them. And uh, he said, yes, so Shamsundar, I'm, thank you very much for arranging this nice dance last night. <laughs> I heard it was a big success. So how much did you collect? So, and uh, Shamsundar said, uh, yes, it was very nice and uh, I'm not too sure. And uh, I think it is, I think we have collected about, uh, Malati was keeping track of all the money. I think we have collected about $2,000. So Prabhupada's eyes widened, $2,000, very good. And how much did you spend? <clears throat> and Prabhupada appreciated Shamsundar. I heard you, have, you, you, have the, you were the leader of this. So Shamsundar said, no, no, Swamiji, uh, we all work together. And no, Mukunda told me, you are the leader. <laughs> and he was very happy to hear that. And then talked about the money. And then how much did you spend? And uh, so Shamsundar had not kept track. You know, we have not kept track of the expense, uh, Swami. We got the hall free and most of the bands, they all came practically free or we had to give them a small graduate. No, no, leader means you must be conscious. You must know how much you earn, how much you spend, how much profit you make. Come, I will show you. You know how to you have you do you know bookkeeping? Yes, and Shamsundar said, Oh, bookkeeping. Somewhere in high school I read something about it. I will teach you. Mukunda, get a piece of paper. And then Mukunda got a piece of paper. And Shamsunda, come and I'll show you. And then he drew a line and he said, Here you must write income, and here you must write expense. Like this, you must maintain. And in this way, all the ex income that is coming, all the expenses you should record. And Shamsundar was thinking, oh my God, I have to maintain all this. And then, because he was not that kind of a number and meticulously keeping things like that. He was more into action oriented person. And then uh, the next few days or so, Shamsundar Prabhupada would call him and ask him, where have you kept the accounts? And if sometimes for some 30 cents or something, he didn't bring a bill, Prabhupada would get very upset. Why didn't you bring the bill? Okay, okay, Swami, I will get the bill. So like this, uh, Srila Prabhupada began introducing the Hare Krishna Mantra and Krishna Consciousness to these seekers in San Francisco. And this is how the second ISKCON temple Established. Hare Krishna.